Hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Kiva Schuler. I'm the founder here at the Giants Institute for Parenting. And oof, are we about to have a vulnerable conversation? But lucky for me, we get to have it with uh, Rebecca Lidden. Hello, my friend. <laughs> I'm having a little bit of a, um, oh my gosh, I can't believe I agreed to do this and I might cry on this call. So I'm just going to name that I'm feeling very more raw today than when we spoke about this yesterday. Um, so just to give some context, everyone, um, I've, I really had a lot of conversations within myself about having this conversation publicly about bringing this forward. I feel nervousness in my body about potential judgment, about naming this uh, story that I'm going to talk about today. But when Rebecca and I spoke about it, you know, thank goodness I have access to an army of parenting coaches led by the amazing <laughs> Rebecca Lidden, who's our director of education. Um, it felt important because I think sometimes there's this idea that I'm just going to breathe for a second. <sighs> I think sometimes there's this idea that when you are a peaceful parent, a gentle parent, a conscious parent, um, I am the founder of a peaceful parenting institute, um, that somehow things won't go wrong or that you won't have... Um, bad experiences with your children and many of our parents join us um, you know when their kids are small you know two and four and how do I get my little guy to get his shoes on and out the door and oh it's so frustrating and so hard and that's um that's when I started this business was in that moment and now uh, my children are grown-ups I mean they're 16 and 17 but for all intents and purposes they're you know they're past that and um, and the the scary side of that is that the consequences of their decisions are so much bigger when they are teenagers than when they are uh, are small you know <laughs> there's different challenges and so just to tell what happened and then we'll get into conversation with Rebecca um, it was prom weekend, this last weekend, where I live, and um, I have amazing kids. You know, they are smart, emotionally intelligent, kind, generous. They volunteer. They do great in school, and they're teenagers. And thank goodness they came back to my house after the prom, and someone um, brought a joint that had been laced uh, with what we think was PCP. And I woke up to blood curdling screams at midnight. I thought someone was dead. I thought there must be blood. I thought the house must be on fire. Um, my, my son was having a dissociative violent reaction to the drugs. Three of the girls were essentially catatonic um, it was an incredibly scary situation. And it took me what seems like an eternity to figure out that everyone was actually alive and not bleeding and not dying. Um, and then I got to put my best peaceful parenting practices of nervous system regulation and making things safe uh, to use. And of course, there have been many conversations, uh, not only with my own children, but with all the kids that were there. Um, and uh, since then, and a lot of questioning, of course, of myself as a parent that this happened. But this is so scary. Um, you know, I said to the kids, when you're a teenager, it's not, you know, like, it's not the big stuff that gets you. It's the one decision in the moment that can have, I mean, God, Rebecca said yesterday, that could have been so much worse. And it could have, it could have been so much worse. And also how do we use this um, as a teaching moment for me as a parent, for the kids um, and for our community? 
Uh, so Rebecca, I'll just kind of turn things over to you and have you re-re-regulate me. <laughs> I'm feeling <laughs> shock that maybe you're experiencing right now where it's really settling into the cell. And, you know, yesterday we talked about the conversations that were had with your children. The, you know, we named it as, and this is not flippant in any way or dismissing of the gravity of this scenario, but as almost as a rite of passage or initiation. And I just really want to reiterate that that is not dismissing the gravity of this. It did say like, it was a wake up call for everyone. Yeah. And yes, there is opportunity. There's abundant opportunity here for your children to wake up to the fact that they are no longer children. <laughs> They are entering into the arena of adulthood where it is a split second decision that can alter your path in life forever. That is yeah. sobering, <laughs> pun intended here. And so we talked a lot about the teachings your children were able, you facilitated with them. But I'm wondering, Kiva, right now in this moment, what is the opportunity for you as the parent? What are your teachings? What is your initiation? Mm -hmm. There is a, I call them beautiful offals. There is a beautiful offal at this point of parenting where it's, you know, I call these forehead on the floor moments, right? Where we have to accept the truth that if freedom is a value that we hold as a person, right? That I believe in the autonomy of all human beings, then there's inherent risk in that value. There, you know, um, it's, it's interesting how these things come in cycles. Yesterday also, I was made aware of a, a distant friend, you know, someone who I haven't talked to and teens in a car around a corner, the worst of the worst happening. There was not drinking involved in that situation. It was it was bad, you know, driving it, it, late at night. At some point, I think this is why I'm so shaken and just like, whew, because there's this radical truth that they're, they're, they are, you know, these are now children with car keys. These are children with access to many things uh, in this modern time. And there is this inherent risk that they may be harmed. And that just is, right? Like we could put all the padded room around them and try and protect them from all the things, but then that bumps up against that volume of, of autonomy and freedom. And so as a person who has chosen the path of values-led parenting, which means that I give my children trust and autonomy we get to sit in this pain and discomfort. Those two things are actually mutually, like they come together. Mm -hmm. I think that's the lesson for me, is becoming a parent who can sit in the painful moments with my children as their mentor, as their guide, as their advocate, mm -hmm. um, while not telling myself the lie that I can protect them all the time from all bad things, from all bad decisions, from all bad choices. Mm -hmm. It reminds me, thank you, Kiva. It reminds me of the quote, the risk and the reward. And I'm hearing that there is great risk and reward in living in alignment with your values as a mother, with freedom, autonomy, sovereignty, trust and being the facilitator of your children's initiations into these values. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in the irony, Kiva, after a conversation, I had a coaching session with a, a student whose daughter was caught vaping in the bathroom. She's 11. <sighs> Yeah, and and this parent was sitting in exactly this 
discomfort that you're naming where I can't control my child and I have these core values of sovereignty, freedom, autonomy, trust, and health and safety and communication. So how do we live in the gray? How do we live in the both and? And yeah. I'm wondering how can you take this macro, these macro values that are almost a spiritual path <laughs> and harness them into the nitty gritty day to day. Yeah. And what conversations were had, what boundaries were put into place, what agreements mm -hmm. were made, what non-negotiables can be made in the context of I can't control anyone or their choices, but it's yeah. not here. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, you know, I have been someone who has always believed in being really open and honest uh, with with my children, treating them as equals in a way, you know, not uh, diminishing, you know, we've had death in our family, we've had divorce in our family, we've had addiction in our family, we have uh, transgender family members, right? So we are a family that is attuned to having difficult conversations and not, not naming. Um, and so I think part of the shock for me was I have been very open with the children about what is happening with fentanyl, with, with drugs being um, messed with, and that they, you know, should not smoke anything that they, you know, like, I'm not going to lie to myself that a 17 year old and 16 year old are not going to experiment with, you know, alcohol and, and marijuana. Like, let's just name that I'm not someone who's been telling myself that my kids aren't going to do that. And so I've tried to say safe source, safe source, safe source. And so that was a bit of my like, I've been saying safe source for years. You knew better. And what's interesting, Rebecca, in processing with my son, you know, that's part of what triggered his panic because mm -hmm. he, because he had the awareness that um, things, you know, he, he kept saying, this is happening. Call 911. This is happening. And so in the post production, right in the after it actually, I mean, you know, so often the consequence is the, right, like the consequence of that bad decision was his experience. And man, would I be surprised if any of, you know, my son or my daughter made that choice again. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry that they had to learn it that way. But it was like the, the, the teaching that I'd been given them was then reinforced by the experience they had. And now I think pray that the lesson was absorbed and I was I was thinking about this because that makes me question everything right like maybe I shouldn't have told him because if I didn't tell him then he wouldn't have had the panic attack and maybe things wouldn't have escalated could have should have would have been all over myself but then I think back to when I was a teenager and my mom is I love my mother she's amazing <laughs> if my mom's here but my mom instilled the fear of God into me, right? She literally said to me, I mean, I've, I've never really tried hard drugs probably because of this, but she said like, if you do cocaine once, you're going to be immediately addicted immediately and die. But then like, I'd see people, you know, it's I'm like, I grew up in the eighties on Long Island. There was that drug around and I'd see them do it. And I'm like, well, they're not dead and they're not doing it all the time. So I stopped believing her, right? Like I didn't believe her interpretation of all the bad things that were going to happen if I did bad things. So then I just did the bad things and bad things didn't happen. Mm. So I was, I actually found myself centered back to a place of gratitude that I talked to him about this. You know, yes, of course, I'm still questioning everything, but mm. I'm like, yeah, but what they experienced is what I'd been telling them. And so in a way it was like 27 times more potent. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know. What are you hearing? Well, all I'm hearing is I'm questioning everything and I'm wondering that you're naming that you're questioning. Should I have given them that teaching in the first place? Mm -hmm. Bring that back to, well, the teachings I got as a young person, I didn't believe them. They weren't true. So yeah. 
your process and practice was moving away from that you're going to die if you try it into education mm -hmm. yeah 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 and you know and i think that's you know where i can find so much gratitude for having had number one having done the work that we teach at jai of nervous system regulation of you know like nobody got angry you know, one of the things I said grateful, I was grateful to you for yesterday is, you know, I was there, but also my partner, Steve, was there. And he is so grounded and so self-aware and so kind and level-headed. These are the values that we teach, right, is, is taking the parents' emotions and reactivity off the table to give the children space for what you know if it's that they're having a bad trip right that that there was space for that and i'm so glad they were at my house mm -hmm. where there were two adults who had that capacity to meet them in what must have been a terrifying experience for them and be met with no anger no shaming no fear being added, right? Like, hey, buddy, come over here with me. We're going to, yeah, let's get you some water. Everything's okay. And the, the entire, you know, that traumatic moment de-escalated really, really quickly. So I'm very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm grateful that I have a parenting coach to reach out to because when you go through a traumatic experience, as I'm recognizing yesterday, I was actually calmer about it than I am today. It, it, it moves in waves. These things take processing. And this is the work, Rebecca, that you do. And, and thank goodness. Yeah, because I wonder, Kiva, if you didn't have this internal solidity, although it's coming in waves, you, you have an anchor, eyewitness. If you were in a space of shutdown right now or complete disorientation, you wouldn't be able to support your children and facilitate them in this aftermath phase. Yeah. And what was very traumatic for all of you, I imagine without this, these tools and community and support and communication and trust and security of relationship you have in your family, this would potentially have a decade or more influence probably in mm. your children's development or even your family's system. Yeah, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the the modeling that this experience could have for other families because yeah. this is something that I think so many families hide and pretend aren't happening and they're silent and the shame spirals and that just has. Yeah, I mean, that's why I wanted to come in and do this live with you today because if we as leaders in this space can't name our vulnerable moments and if this message, you know, gets to one parent who chooses to have an empowering, honest conversation with their kids about drugs, so that there's a better outcome when the worst thing happens and that there isn't years of relational disrepair or, you know, when I think about like, okay, if, if the kids had come to me and I had a different value system and I punished them and yelled at them and told them how stupid they were, well, where are they going to go next time to do the thing? And they sure as heck aren't going to tell me about it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so Raina is saying it sounds like a huge pivotal point in your relationship. They're always going to go to you now. I mean, the blessing is I started parenting without punishments and consequences, open communication when my children were four and six, three and five. Now I have had breaches, many of them. There have been, we've had, you know, a lot of ups and downs in our family. I've had periods where I've had to call in Rebecca and go back through the program again 
uh, particularly when my daughter was about 14, which is just a, you know, traditionally very difficult time between mothers and daughters. I'm not a perfect parent. But the thing that I, you know, will say, you know, for those of you who have young children, is when you parent this way, they will always come to you. Um, there's just like the trust, it's the most precious gift that yeah. like painting that trumps everything else in my book. I mean, the, like you're saying, the reality is we, we can lock our children in their rooms their entire teenage years to protect them from life or death situations. But it's ultimately the trust that saves lives here. Yeah. Yeah, it's the trust that saves lives. Wow, that just landed really intensely for me. Um, and it's born true, you know, I have been the parent to make the call when the children hear, you know, their friends having suicidal ideation. I've been that parent three times now. Um, I'm so glad that that is, um, yeah, it's hard, but it's so important. You know, I'd rather be the parent bearing the weight of navigating these circumstances than be the parent who's in the dark about them. Mm, so I'm wondering, Kiva, I think I'm feeling that there are very many parents maybe listening who are potentially grieving or even experiencing shame right now listening to you because they maybe don't have that bridge of trust between them and the child and it's a like how do I even begin yeah yeah I mean I would turn that question back to you from my experience as a parent however mm -hmm. with one vulnerable conversation at a time yeah you know you taught me leaders go first that's a phrase that you use and so many of the students and clients i have with the, these aged children it begins with transparency vulnerability and communication it's a owning of i have not been a safe person for you and I'm going to own the responsibility that I have that you may not trust me to come to me with yeah. that And clients and students who have said that to their teens and tweens, those kids just melt. They had no idea that that was what was happening because they don't have necessarily maybe that internal dialogue or the ability to really put the pin on it. But hear the adult name it, it's the... Oh, it's so, it's like like a, I can feel what that must be like, like just a relief of like oh, I feel like thank you, you know, thank you. And you know, I think if there's you know, when I went through you know, I went through probably a year of of disconnection with Charlotte, and it was so painful and so hard. And I I had done the thing to lose her trust. I take full responsibility for the circumstances that led to that, it took her a long time to trust me again. And, and and I think that's the other piece is like being willing, like it's not about, this is why like saying you're sorry is such a meaningless expression of forgiveness. We have to be willing to show up consistently in that way. And it may take a month, it may take six months, it may take a year and these are our children. Yeah. So it takes a year. Okay, great. But then, like that day, they come back. I remember the thing that finally broke that. I actually, uh, a friend had come over, and and they were kind of like doing that thing where you all poke fun at a person, and it was me. Mm. And some person left, and I was like, "Wow, Charlotte, that was mm. that dinner was felt really hard. I felt really attacked, and I felt I felt judged as a mom." And I hear these things you're saying, and also, like, you know, don't, like, our family's really great. And she just, that was it. She just broke and, you know, and, and said this thing I'll never forget. She said, Mom, I realize 
that because this other thing had happened, I've been blaming you for everything since then. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, it's just like cuddle puddles and trust and communication. And she wants to be with me all the time. She calls me mommy again, oh. you know, like, you know, <laughs> how to have a mother cry, have your 16 year old call you mommy. <laughs> I love Rebecca. I think that there's mm -hmm. some good information. Perhaps we talked yesterday about the communication with the kids after um, the next day. So um, I'd love to talk a little bit about, you know, what that looked like when everyone woke up the next morning and was safe and, you know, in some cases feeling really embarrassed, feeling a lot of shame. Uh, the child who brought the um, a legal substance was just bereft with, it's my fault, I did this, I'm, you know, I'm the bad one. Yeah, right. Ooh, yeah, I really appreciate this. And it, it, I'm going to ask you a question really quickly. And before then, what's coming up for me is when our children are in that like shame space and self blame space, which is natural, we go there and we need support through it. What's really powerful in response, I wonder if this was accessible to you, Kiva, where instead of brushing it away and like, no, 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 and you're fine. And it just happens. It's more of a, like, yeah, yeah, your choice had severe <laughs> consequences. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky because this isn't my kid, um, you know, and and uh, already a person who struggles with anxiety, already a person, probably why this person is self-medicating, um, already a person who lacks esteem, um, who struggles with confidence. And so I was very gentle while trying to hold the gravity of that decision for her. For this person. Yeah. Uh, so the word sounded like this is a mistake that so many people make. Mm -hmm. This is an easy mistake to make. Mm -hmm. It's a mistake that's killing people mm -hmm. now because of fentanyl. What have you, like, tell me what you've learned. She had of her own uh, volition called everyone she knew that had gotten substances from this person um, to let them know to get rid of them. I thought that that was a responsible action. I was really happy mm -hmm. to hear the accountability in that choice. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just imagining this now. <laughs> I know. It just, it, it's so hard because your heart breaks, you know, like my heart breaks that, that these kids that I, I mean, I love them. I love teenagers. They are so amazing. Um, I adore them and that they had to have this experience and feel these things and God, go, what must, like, that must have been wild in not a good way uh, to feel inside of their bodies that they could not control what was happening to them and the fear of what they might have ingested. Um, I can't imagine, and it's heartbreaking. You know, I, I'm so, so sad that these kids that I love had to have this experience. Yeah, it makes me think about these challenging experiences that we have that make us question everything and then guide us back to our own value system. And we know that our values drive our decisions. And I am thinking about Sarah Moore, our other trainer here, who does this really cute thing where she says that boundaries are our children's floaties in the swimming pool of life. And we talked yesterday a little bit about these very practical agreements that were made between you and your children going forward. So, you know, they just had this huge wake up call. Now, what are the tethers mm -hmm. that guide their decisions going forward? About freedom with bumpers. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> like here in New England, we have that bowling, uh, what's it called, like with the little balls, candle pin bowling. Mm -hmm. And when the kids were little, they would put these inflatable things in the gutter so the ball could just, you know. <laughs> so we have that kind of um, vernacular that's in our family language. Those are the bumpers. Mm -hmm. um, so the bumpers have gotten a little bit bigger. Um, and so uh, the agreements that we have made and, and that the kids have also made with their friends um, is that uh, no substances may be brought into our home. Um, that's just now a hard boundary. Um, the other new boundary for now, I don't know how long this will, will be in place, but I'm not comfortable having uh, other kids in our home if I'm not there. So, you know, in the past, if I was out to dinner, if I was, you know, gone during the day, free for all, the more the merrier, this is a safe place to be. Um, that was such, that situation could have gone, if, if there had not been adults present, right? Like, imagine they did that at the prom, or imagine, oh, God forbid, that they did it in the car, or at a house where there, you know, were people that were going to start screaming at them while they're, um, under the influence, um, it could have had tragic, I mean, it was bad enough the way it was, it would have had tragic consequences. Mm -hmm. And so I, as a parent, no longer feel safe mm -hmm. having my kids in that circumstance. And so for now, uh, nobody, you know, in that, like, you know, go to friends if parents are there, I will be checking in. When kids are over our house, there will be check-ins, which is also like, I love to go to bed. They tuck me in. They've been tucking me in for like seven years, you guys. And they stay up way later than um, Now, if there's friends in the house, you know, going to set a little alarm and just do a couple check-ins until everyone's asleep. Mm -hmm. I need my safety to be re- I really love as a starting point, especially with tweens and teens, that is one of the core navigations that we use in what is called a willingness practice where safety mm -hmm. is the center. So I have no willingness to agree to saying yes to you being here in our home without me. That crosses right now, today in this moment, my need for safety. Yep. And letting that be a conversation. And I'm wondering, it's kind of spiraling back to the beginning, is there any part of you as a parent right now, and maybe you had communicated this, but is there any part of you right now who wishes that this very clear, there are no substances in the house boundary had been, I would even say like intensely named or? Mm. Of course, of course. Okay. And in my journaling about this, in my conversations with you, my parenting coach about this, the, the consequences of them, it's outweighed by the, the consequences of me knowing that they probably would have done it anyway. I get it. And thank goodness they were at my house. Mm -hmm. Do you know, like, like, do I wish that I have teenagers who never get in a car when they shouldn't? who never experiment with illegal substances, who never drink alcohol, who never uh, have sex before, you know, to 21. Um, of course I wish that. <laughs> and um, good luck with that, right? So I don't know about you. I was parented with the, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do this. You're not, I did most of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're all honest with ourselves, right? So... Of course, I grapple with it. Should I, shouldn't have I, am I, you know, am I being too permissive? Am I not putting enough safety nets around them? Am I, you know, is, you know, maybe all these authoritarian people are right. Maybe my entire <laughs> life's work is based on a false premise. But then when I look at that, that's fear talking. Yeah, because right. when I look at it with, with why, my wise Kiva, right? Like we all have this wisdom voice inside of us. The wisdom voice knows that them trusting me, them being able to learn the lesson from the lesson, mm. to have the consequences of the decision is so much more powerful than me, mom, setting a boundary based on fear. Mm -hmm. 
I tend to set boundaries based on values. Yes, safety, as we just communicated first, always safety first, but I tend to be more led by values. And I've said from when the kids were little, it's important to me to raise leaders who are thinkers. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it's like, I've said it since they were little, you know, like we are a family of thinkers. We are a family of leaders. That doesn't, that's not always easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easier to be somebody who goes along to get along. It's easier to fit in. It's easier to maintain the status quo. It's easier to parent using authoritarian, right? Like do as I say, but it has such a big cost to the long-term trust and relationship that I, it just always brings me back to you, like, we can't avoid these things from happening. And so let's create the best possible relationship container for us to all get through it alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many thought the irony of having the the false belief that when I say a boundary to my child, you cannot X, Y, Z, that is God, <laughs> that it just is. We, we think our word is stone and it's very humbling to understand that our boundaries are ultimately requests. We have no authority to make demands on our children. Yeah. They are yeah. requests especially when they do come from that space of inner safety where it's not a fear-driven request, it's not a control-driven request, but it, it is really this solid, rooted, yeah. this is a no for me. And when we have that security of relationship with our parent or our partner or our friend, mm -hmm. it is intrinsic motivation to honor the request of the other person in our intimate dyad. There's another huge, and, and I don't, I, it just occurred to me to name this. So what the world says happens with teenagers is we set boundaries and they're like, this isn't fair and slamming doors and I hate you and you're the worst person ever. Um, when we talked about this on Sunday and again on Monday, um, the kids felt so right about the new boundaries. Yeah, they were so in agreement. Yeah. Yes, mom. Yes, we agree to that. Yes, that is a good idea. Yes, we want to. They want to live. They want yes, to live. they really do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, assuming, assuming that our children you know, want that vibrancy and quality of life that we want for them. They want it too. Yeah. Just gotta yeah, so it. it's like even in the setting of the new boundaries, there was no power over dynamic. I wasn't doing anything to them. We were creating a new structure to move forward as a family together safely. And that's actually kind of earth shattering. Yeah, it is. We yell. <laughs> it's community. It is such a beautiful image. I'm wondering how you're feeling now, having moved through it I mean, again. I'm feeling like I want to go have a good cry, but yeah. in a you know, like a good, like, okay, I can shake this out of my nervous system now. We did it. We navigated it. So many valuable lessons were learned. Trust was earned. Um, and just, you know, like, thank God, you know, because as sad as it is, there are stories like this every day of great kids who make one bad move and it has life-defining, if not life-ending, consequences.
Thank you, Kiva, for bearing it all. To witness. You guys, thank you for being so kind with all the hearts and the supportive comments. I was super unsure about this one, um, and you've just all made me feel really safe, and um, I'm really grateful for that. All right. Mwah! Keep them safe. All right. Bye, love.